Well, I just want to tell you this morning that I'm amped to be here. <laughs> uh, I just need to kind of break the ice. Many of you know this, but on Father's Day, one of my sons died. And um, the elders and Pastor John were very gracious when they found out the news. They called me and said, hey, we'd like to alleviate any stress in your life, and you don't have to come and preach here at First Baptist and I said to them, John, I need to preach. I need to get back to my life. And I need to see people I love and be embraced by the body of Christ. I'm a hurting member, but um, I know God will sustain us. It's very difficult to watch your six other children grieve the loss of a brother at 36. And uh, his wife was expecting their first child, which he was ecstatic about. And um, it's just been a difficult several weeks. But I just need to tell you that I need to be here. And I need to be among you. And I need to preach. And uh, that's what God has called me to do. Sometimes people ask, and I think I mentioned this the last time I was here, how do you come up with your sermons or how do you give what you're going to present, because sometimes I, I follow in the order of what the pastor's been doing in terms of a series, which I did the last time I was here. But this message came from the fact that Debbie and I were visiting some friends up north, and we went to their, their church, and the worship pastor in one of their sets read this text that we just read out of Hebrews chapter 2. And I said to myself at that moment, that's the next text that I would like to preach at the next opportunity that I have. You're the next opportunity. <laughs> and it's a, it happens to be a text on death. And I wondered if I could, uh, you know, prepare this message and do it and stay composed. And I think God can give me the grace. I had to do a eulogy at my son's funeral. And I had to speak and I had prayed. I had 20 people get up at 6 o'clock six o'clock on Wednesday morning prior to the funeral and pray that uh, God would give me the grace to say the things that would honor God but honor my son and still stay composed. So that's how I've come up with this text. I have basically said I was going to prepare this message and preach it. Oh, here we go. We got a whole pulpit here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Oh, you're afraid, we're afraid that's going to go over, I guess. Huh? Now it's on the cord and it's kind of imbalanced. It might fall this way, this way, who knows? Whatever happens, happens today. By the way, um, I never take lightly the fact that I preach in a church like this, and, and I say this to the congregation. Take seriously the things that God has to say to you today because this event with these people will never happen again. It'll never happen again. But for some reason, God has ordained this moment at this time for you and for me to come together and to speak about things that have eternal weight and significance. And so today I'm going to speak on death. That's what this text is about. It's really about slavery to the fear of death and what Jesus has done coming as a human being to this earth. Now, we know that what that word is. It's called the incarnation. So if I say the word incarnation, don't think I'm trying to go crazy or over your head. What I mean by that and what I think most of you understand is the incarnation of Jesus was that he came to earth. He stepped out of eternity into space and time and he became a baby he was born of a virgin and he lived a life in human flesh just like we do with all the emotions and all the hurts and all the sufferings and all the details that come into our life Jesus identifies with us because he was a human being and that is the incarnation and really this message should be a Christmas message because it's the reason that Jesus came to earth this text is a Christmas text 
It speaks to the incarnation of Jesus and it has angelic music with it. <laughs> when I was uh, on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ many years ago, I read a book by a guy by the name of Joe Bailey. Some of you may remember him. I believe he was on staff with InterVarsity. And he wrote a book called The Last Thing We Ever Talk About. He had had three sons that died. Two, tragically, um, one, I can't remember all the details, but he had had three sons that had died, and he was talking about death. And it's the last thing many people want to ever get into a conversation about. We try to fill our lives with all kinds of other sorts of distractions, business, music, sports, whatever it is. We try to keep our minds away from the thoughts of death and dying. But it's all over. The rock and roll culture of America has sort of glorified and fantasized death and dying. I memorized this a long time ago just because I was giving a message to high school students, but it was by a group called ACDC. Anybody still remember ACDC? Oh, man, I've got some fans here. And they're, they're, one of their famous songs was called Highway to Hell. So I'll just give you some of the, some of the lyric to that. Living easy, living free. Season ticket on a one-way ride. Asking nothing, let me be. I'm taking everything in stride. Don't need reason, don't need rhyme. Ain't nothing I would rather do. Going down, party time. My friends are going to be there too. I'm on a highway to hell. I'm on a highway to hell. No stop sign, speed limit. Nobody's going to slow me down like a wheel going to spin it. Nobody's going to mess me around. Hey, Satan, paid my dues playing in a rock and roll band. Hey, mama, look at me. I'm headed to the promised land. I'm on a highway to hell. I'm on a highway to hell. Comedians in our day and age often toy and insult and play with the idea of death. Robin Williams, the late Robin Williams, says, death is nature's way of saying your table is set. Woody Allen, another contemporary comedian, said this. He said, in my next life, I want to live a life backwards. You start out dead, and you get that out of the way. Then you wake up in an old people's home, feeling better every day. You get kicked out for being too healthy. You collect your pension, start work, and get a gold watch and a party on your first day. Woody Allen also said this. I don't fear death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. But you know, I think there's something to that statement that Woody Allen makes. I don't fear death because I think everybody does fear death. Everybody does fear death. There is a fear of dying that is per pervasive, and people experience it. I think sometimes they subdue it into their subconscious, and the moment it comes up, they fill their life with something else. They try to accelerate back into busyness so they don't have to contemplate death and dying. Anna Akhtatova, who was a Russian poet of descent, said it this way, War and plague may pass, but no one can cope with the terror that is named the flight of time. Now this morning's text out of the book of Hebrews, as I said, is a text about the incarnation, the coming of Jesus. It could be a Christmas text. It is an incredibly hopeful and life-giving scripture. Jesus our great God and Savior came to help you this morning. He came to help me this morning. He came to free us from the fear of death and dying. This day, Jesus stands here to speak to you and to help you so that you are not under the bondage and the slavery of such fear. Jesus entered space and time. He took on flesh and life-giving blood as we've just celebrated. He became just like us, just for us. He did this with a determined destiny of death. In his physical death, we'll see this morning, 
that he did so to destroy the works of the devil and deliver us, the children of faith, from the fear and slavery of death and to satisfy the very justice of our holy God. And so this morning I have three points. Um, as many of you know, I like to alliterate. It just helps me. And so they, they all start with D this morning. And hopefully they, they represent the text. And so this morning I want us to look back here into the book of Hebrews chapter 2 in verses 14 to 16. Jesus came to earth to destroy the work of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. And I want to read verses 14 to 16 one more time. And I am reading out of the ES, ESV, just as you are. And, uh, but there's a, a time where I'll mention something about other translations if you have a different one. Verse 14. Since, therefore, the children share in fresh, flesh and blood. Now, if you go back into the text, the children is a reference to all believers, all who are Christ's followers. You're the children. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, human beings, he himself likewise partook of the same things. He became a human being. He took on flesh. He had blood. He lived like us. And through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Again, Jesus became a man because what was necessary was the death of a man who was actually more than a man. As one writer puts it this way, insightfully speaking about what Jesus did when he came to earth, the incarnation was God locking himself in on death row. Jesus chose death. Jesus embraced dying. This is why he came. Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says this, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. Is it any wonder that Satan would try to detour Jesus' march to the cross as we read in the Gospels? If anything, Satan wanted to keep Jesus from doing anything that would help alleviate the condemnation of sin that all people fall under. If you remember Jesus' temptations in Mark chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights prior to his beginning of earthly ministry. And Satan comes and tempts him. And if you remember the temptations, first of all, he says, after he's extremely hungry, 40 days, 40 nights fasting, we all know how hungry we would be. And he says, if you're really the son of God, then you could take this rock, you could take these stones and turn them into bread. And Jesus said, with scripture, man does not live on bread alone. And he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, if you're really the son of God, you could cast yourself down for the scriptures. Say that the angels will come and they'll grab you in their, they'll lift you in their hands so that your foot will not strike a stone. And Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And finally, Satan takes him to a high mountain and he looks over all the kingdoms of the world and he says to Jesus, this is all yours if you'll just bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. And Satan left. He wanted to detour the march to the cross because he knew that the cross was his defeat. Was his defeat. You maybe remember the, the time in Matthew chapter 16 when Peter is told by Jesus that we're going to Jerusalem where the elders and the scribes and the chief priests are going to kill me. And Peter jumps in and said, Lord, we're not letting that happen. And if you remember what Jesus said to him, he said, behind me, Satan. You do not understand. You're not thinking like God. You're thinking like men. You see, if there was a way that Satan 
could stop Jesus from going to the cross, he could still have the ability to condemn human beings because of their sin. And he could continue to allow the slavery of the fear of death to overwhelm humanity because our sin is uncovered and we're guilty. But Jesus' incarnation, the meaning of why he came, was to die. That was his destiny, the cross. And the cross was Satan's destruction. I want you to notice in verse 14 that the writer of the book of Hebrews says that Jesus partook in the same things that we did and that through his death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now I just want to say something about that phrase, the power of death. Satan has the power of death. And I think what the writer is intending for us to understand here is that Satan has the ability to make death frightening, to make death fearful. He has the power of death. He holds men in bondage through the fear of death. And although sometimes people won't admit to it, I honestly believe that everybody has that fear residing somewhere in their soul. It is the power to keep men in sin that makes death dreadful. Death is pervasive. It's a haunting fear. But here's what Jesus did. Jesus stripped Satan's power. He disarmed the deceptor. He gave each one of us as believers and followers of Christ, the breastplate of righteousness, which is immune to condemnation from the evil one. He was a person. He is the person without sin who died so that we could be the people without sin to be condemned. Not that we'll never sin, but our sin is covered and forgiven because of the work and the accomplishment of Jesus upon the cross. Satan's intention was to destroy God's rule by condemning God's followers to his, and God's, in God's own courtroom of justice. But in Christ, there is no condemnation, the Bible says. Satan's treachery is dismantled. The cross is his defeat. By his death, Jesus wiped away all sins. And forgiven people are indestructible. Forgiven people are indestructible. If I could just indulge you, I don't like you to turn lots of times because I think it distracts from our text, but I do have two verses I just want us to look at so we see the import of this outside of just the writer of the book of Hebrews. I want you to turn just a little bit over to your right side in the Bible to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 8, 1 John chapter 3. I kind of jokingly used to say, I thought this would be the good front of a Christmas card. Um, again, the incarnation, why Jesus came, but it's not very warm and fuzzy. It doesn't have a baby and it doesn't have a donkey and it doesn't have a fuzzy sheep. But it is a correct text for Christmas. Here John writes in his letter these words. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And then it goes on in verse 9. You'll see, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for his seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God do you see, this is what John is also saying. He's saying the reason that Jesus came 
was to cover the sins of his people who are born of the seed of God, born again. And they do not keep on sinning. Yes, we're going to sin the rest of our lives. This is a part of who we are. But our sin has been forgiven by Jesus on the basis of his death on the cross. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And if you turn back just for a moment to the book of Colossians, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2. Keep your finger in Hebrews chapter 2. I don't want you to leave that text. But I want you to see this again emphasized by the Apostle Paul. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Colossians 2, 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of our debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He disarmed Satan. He disarmed the demonic. He disarmed all evil authority by his death on the cross when he was nailed to the cross. The cry was, it is finished. No longer condemnation for those who believe. And friends, if you believe today, you can know that Christ has done a work on your behalf. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, you should be considering the fact that Jesus has died to set you free from slavery and bondage to the fear of death. That's what he's done for each of us. And he wants that to be an immediate effect. He wants you to go from here today without that haunting fear hovering over you. Jesus disarmed the rulers. Jesus' incarnation was to destroy the works of the devil. Secondly, Jesus' incarnation was to deliver his children from the fear of death. Now, we've already been touching on that. The writer of the book of Hebrews wants us to know that we all have been held captive, enslaved, all people, even if they don't know it. They just deny it. Subconsciously, they deny it. They don't want to think about it. Let's put everything else in our life so we never have to consider the eternal realities of the fact that we are mortals and that we're going to die. Jesus came to deliver us from this enslavement. Here's what Jesus' response would be to the slavery of the fear of death. This is what he would say to deliver your hearts from this kind of thinking, oppression. Dear child, I am God. Child, I am the word that became flesh and has dwelt among you. I laid down my life for you. I cover all your sins and impart to you a righteousness that you've never had before. I conquer death. I conquer Satan who holds the power of death. I rise from the dead. I remove the fear of death. Your life is forever hidden with me in God. I am your liberator. There is no condemnation. There is no charge that can be brought against you. There is no one that can separate you from my love. There is no one that is greater. He that is greater, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. I have come to give you this assurance. Death is swallowed in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? I've come to remove the fear of death and dying. I've come to liberate you, deliver you. 
And I've come here to do it today. This morning, Jesus speaks to me. He speaks to you. Death is terrifying, but in Christ, we know that it isn't. There is hope. You know, when Jesus, in the book of Hebrews, a little later on, says this, the writer is exhorting us to persevere in our faith. And he says this, he says, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and he despised the shame. And then he was seated at the right hand of God for the joy that was set before him. And you know what that joy was that Jesus had? It was the future. It was the ingathering of you, his children. He took on human flesh to be like you, to deliver you from the fear of dying. And there was a joy that allowed him to suffer and to die. Because one day he knew it was happy. It was joy. It was together. It was worship. And he did it for us. God means for our safety to have immediate effect the removal of the slavery and fear, Jesus has delivered us. Many of you have probably heard of Dwight L. Moody, Moody Bible Institute. He was a great man of God, um, started a, a ministry. He was a cobbler, a shoemaker, started an outreach to young children, had a tremendous evangelistic effect certainly upon the city of Chicago. He died in the year of 1899. And I'm not going to read all this because he died in the same year as a very secular famous man did um, during that time, Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll, who was a, uh, had these lectures at Harvard and uh, he, he did not believe in Jesus. But in the same year, Moody died. And this is what he said as he was lying on his deathbed. This is a man who walked with Christ and who understood what Jesus had done in covering his sin, even though he would admit to being a sinner. But he had a great Savior. And as he was at his bedside, his son was there, and he said this. He said, earth is receding. Heaven is opening. God is calling. And his son thought he was delusional and said, Dad, Dad, you're dreaming. And Moody responded, No, well, Will, this is no dream. I have been within the gates. I have seen the faces of the children. And for a while it seemed as though Moody was reviving. He then began to slip away. And this is his, these were his words. Is this really death? This is not bad. There is no valley. This is bliss. This is glorious. And by the time his daughter came in, she began to pray for his recovery. And he said, no, no, Emma, do not pray for that. God is calling. This is my coronation day. I've been looking forward to it. And shortly thereafter, Moody received his crown. And they proclaimed, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you have maybe heard of James Montgomery Boyce. He was a Presbyterian minister at 10th Presbyterian, a very good speaker, a godly man who led his congregation. He wrote an excellent, many excellent commentaries. He's He's a man that I have in my library. I have many of his volumes. And James Boyce spoke at conferences that your pastor, old Pastor Scott, myself, we would go to. We could hear James Montgomery Boyce. He was a godly man. But at the age of about 60, he contracted cancer. And I believe he was 61 when he finally passed away. And someone came to him and they said, you're still a young man. You're still productive. You're still enthusiastic. I mean, doesn't dying of cancer, isn't that bothering you? And these were his words. 
I've always said that God has a perfect plan for your life. And I can't argue with perfect. And he died shortly thereafter. Jesus came to earth to destroy the works of the devil and to deliver us from slavery of the fear of death. One last point that I want you to see, it's a little bit different, but you'll see it in this text. Jesus' incarnation, Jesus came to deflect the judgment and anger of God over sin. He came to deflect the judgment of God. I want you to go back into the book of Hebrews, and I want you to see this in the text. Verse 17. Well, I'll read verse 16 again, but I will put this all together in context. For surely it is not angels that Jesus helps, he helps, but he helps Abraham or the offspring of Abraham. We're the offspring of Abraham. We're the spiritual children of Abraham, the great father of Judaism and Christianity, and for that matter, Islam. We are the offspring. We're the sand so numerous on the seashore that you can't count. We're the people that have believed. We've been justified by our faith alone, not by anything else, not by our works, but only by our belief in the accomplishment of what Jesus did at the cross. We are the offspring of Abraham. That's who Jesus is helping. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, I don't want you to get scared of this word propitiation. I want to speak to it for a moment. If you have an an NIV text, a New International, it will say atoning sacrifice. But our text tells us that Jesus had to be made like us so he could become a high priest, our high priest. And you know what a priest did in the Old Testament? They took a sacrifice to God on behalf of the sins of the people. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. He came to be our high priest, and the sacrifice that he took to God was himself. It was not an animal. The shed blood was the shed blood of the man, Christ Jesus. And he took that sacrifice to God on your behalf and on my behalf. He became our faithful high priest to make propitiation. Now let me tell you what that word means. It does mean a sacrifice, an atonement, an appeasement. But the word propitiation has something very vital that we understand in it. It means that he satisfied the just anger of God against sin. He himself became the sin bearer. God poured his wrath upon Jesus for the sins of his people, the sins of the world. And Jesus on the cross was bearing those sins that you and I deserved. We should have been hanging there. We should have been the ones paying a price. But Jesus deflects the judgment of God from us to him so that we might have forgiveness of sins. Past, present, future, today. That's what propitiation means. Sometimes some translations use the word expiation. It doesn't mean the same. Propitiation is about satisfying God's justice. And that's what he did when he came to earth. He came to satisfy the wrath and the justice of God. He deflected God's wrath and judgment onto himself. The son absorbed God's punishment. This is what makes the gospel so great. That God is still just. And in his justice, he condemns his own son, who is a substitute for you and I. 
so that he might experience death and he might forgive sins so that we could be delivered from the slavery of fear and the work of Satan would be defeated. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Peter says it this way, For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. To do what? To bring us to God. When I was living in Carmel, Indiana, um, we had just moved into an old house in the old part of Carmel. Carmel is just expanded. It's the north side of Indianapolis. And uh, it's been many years since we were there. And Debbie and I just moved in and we had our first child there, um, Kirsten. And we had just moved into this old house that we were going to fix up. And it was an older neighborhood. And one of the first days we were there, all of a sudden we get a little knock on the door. And here's this elderly woman at our door. And I kind of opened up. We had a little porch and she came onto the glass porch and she started talking and she had a little track and she handed it to me. She'd come to tell me about Jesus. And um, I said, well, we are believers. Um, I, I work for Campus Crusade for Christ. And I can still remember her words. She goes, well, you look like good folk. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, she was so sweet, and we had a nice little conversation. And she said, well, my husband may be by too. And I found out her husband's name was Roy. I think her name was Christina. That's as I, best of my memory. My memory is kind of fading. You know, I walk into rooms, I'm not even sure why I'm there anymore. But I always think there's a hint in the refrigerator. Okay. So she said, my husband Roy. And, and I found out that Roy had played professional football player way back when with leather helmets and all that kind of stuff. And he was a, you could tell he was a big man for that era. He was kind of bent, so he's kind of bent over, kind of like I'm becoming. And um, he was kind of bent, and he kind of came slow, and he had these massive hands. He told me he was an end, and I could see why. He had, I mean, I have big hands, I have strong hands, but it just seemed like my hands were enveloped into his. And, uh, you know, he always had a word of kind of exhortation, you know, well, you keep walking with Jesus. You know, that kind of stuff. And if I had a friend there, he goes, he saved? Is he saved? You know, that, that was kind of his way. But we kind of saw him as neighbors. And not too long after that, I think we'd had our, maybe, well, it's been a while, we'd had our second child. Because I remember we took him, took him to the nursing home. Roy had to go into a home. And we went in and we took our kids in and we tried to talk to him. And I think he was a little delusional. He was, he was in the dying stage. And we had left. And um, I don't know what the time frame was, weeks or months, we get a knock on the door, and it's Christina, his wife. She says, I just want to tell you that Roy passed, but I need to tell you a story. And I said, yeah, I'm so sorry. And so she told me the story. She said, he'd been laying there just kind of almost unconscious and the nursing home people, the attendants, said basically had done nothing. He just laid there, and they'd fed him the best they could and cared for him, but he just laid there. And then she said, and one day, all of a sudden, everybody, they were there, people were there. He sat up in his bed. He hadn't sat up. He sat up in his bed, and he looked up, and he said, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. And he laid back down and he died. Now, friends, our text this morning is incredibly hopeful. That Jesus came to defeat the work of Satan who wants to condemn us. That's his only weapon. He can condemn people because of their sin, but Jesus has covered it for you. And for me, he came to defeat Satan. He came to deliver you and me from the throes of slavery to fear, dying. And he came to deflect upon himself the judgment of God so that we might be rightly related and stand in righteous 
greatness before him. And someday, someday, look up and say, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. Let's pray. And we thank you for the work that you've accomplished. Oh God, our Savior, Jesus. And we give you all the praise. And I pray that for your church at First Baptist Eaton Rapids, we would leave here with the encouragement that you have done a great work on our behalf. And that we would not live in slavery to the fear of death. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.